I'm Megan Philbrick. I'm the Livestock Program Manager at PFI. I'll be moderating the session. And we are featuring speakers from Norway. They originally were going to Zoom in, but instead called and said, we're coming to America. So we said, please, please join us in person at our conference. So they're here. Um, we'll be hearing from Oscar and Knut. And then we're also hearing from Monty, who is a farmer in Illinois, who is piloting virtual fence. OK, and now what we all came for. Um, this, this topic of virtual fence. I have been excited about virtual fence for about five years now. I think there great, there's great potential to, to see some landscape change through adopting this new technology here in the US. Um, this is no fence, this is their premier event in the United States, so we're so happy they could be here with us. And one other thing is they are looking for some potential pilot project sites with, with Iowa farmers. So at the end of each table, they have, uh, there's a sign up sheet. And if you're interested in working with these folks to potentially have a discussion and potentially do a pilot project, please put your name on the list and they'll, they'll be in touch with you. And of course, I'll visit with them after the session and at their, at their booth. Okay, without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Oscar, Knu, and Monty. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I am um, the founder and uh, the CTO of this Norwegian company, Nofens. Uh, the first picture uh, is a picture of um, myself in the red, uh, red jacket. Uh, at the times when I started thinking about what if these grazing animals, our sheep and our goats, even our pigs, uh, could be on pasture without fencing, it would have been amazing. Uh, but obviously that was not possible at the time. Um, I, I put this up because a lot of people uh, ask me about how did you come up with this idea? Um, and the, and the, actually this, the story is that I enjoy being together with the animals and I sometimes <coughs> need to grass over the fence to them because uh, it was more, <laughs> it was easier to do that than move the fence in the, in the very difficult Norwegian terrain. And it felt really stupid. Why, why do that? <laughs> so I, normally I opened the gate for them, and uh, my father didn't like that always. <laughs> um, so, um, if you sit on. So I, um, I kind of wanted to be a farmer. But then I had an interest for engineering and software and uh, electronics. Uh, but then I have to say I'm, I'm I feel I, I'm living my dream. I'm a small scale far farmer in in Norway. This is actually my goats on my farm, uh, just behind my bar. Uh, and I can have goats. I have <coughs> fences. Uh, so it, it's kind of, uh, as, uh, as an inventor, it, is, it, it feels like I have had success. Um, and that success should be for, for all animals to, to enjoy, <laughs> and for all farmers to enjoy, I feel. So that's why we try to scale this as a business, and now we are visiting the United States, and we will tell more about that later. Uh, but how this actually works? This is uh, this is the product for cattle, uh, and this is actually a GPS receiver, so it knows where on the globe it is at all times. And when the cow that wears this moves out of the pasture that the farmer has put up in an app, I will show it later on the screen. This color starts 
making a sound. It's like when the, when the animal moves out of the posture. And then the animal understands that it needs to go back. Because if not, if, uh, she will feel an electric pulse from the chains. So we have a video showing how the animals how the animals react a bit, but this is this is more uh, how to understand how it works. It is I feel the, the functionality of it is kind of easy to understand, um, and I hope it is. Our customers are saying it's also easy to use. <laughs> so uh, this is what we will talk about now. This is my goats uh, being uh, on a posture, and it shows how. Control it very, yeah. And uh, a bit about how the app looks. Um, if you flip to the next, is um, uh, you put up uh, kind of posts in, in a map on the phone, uh, and then decide how many of the colors that should be attached to that posture. And then it's full flexibility on how to how to draw and put up that posture, and also. Uh, change the posture whenever, whenever you want, actually. So, um, uh, and, and obviously this comes also with, a, with features of looking to, at where the animals actually are. Uh, so, so some of our customers find that kind of uh, nice to, instead of being, go to bed at night and wondering where the animals is, it's possible to just open the phone and look just before you fall asleep where they are. <laughs> so that's a peace of mind part of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we also have some insight into how active the animals are. Uh, and you could also get a heat map on where they usually are located. This day, yesterday, and also last week. Yeah. This is a, this is a picture of uh, strange maybe to put it up, but it's on a ferry on my way here uh, to the airport early morning in Norway, uh, enjoying a cup of coffee. I'm the only one on the ferry, <laughs> uh, and the. the I can buy whatever I want, and hopefully I will pay for it. No one looks after if I if I pay or not. Uh, and it, it, it's kind of it makes me proud of the society I come from. Uh, that the, the trust is at such a level. So and it works. And the, <laughs> it, it becomes better and better each time I take a ferry. So it's it's kind of. Kind of a, a little bit of a proudness to you from Norway. <laughs> and also, I have to mention that the United States for Norwegians is, it's kind of, I have my grand grandfather that uh, uh, my, my grandmother saw him the first time when she was five because then he came back from the United States uh, after. Yeah, he, he needed to make some money, they suffered, and he needed to make some money, and he left for the United States and came back uh, when she was five. And she told that story with tears in her eyes, and kind of, that was the United States that saved them, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. So then Knut will take over, and um, as a founder, I'm also proud to, to, to attract Good people. <laughs> so, so, so Knut is our uh, CEO. Uh, yeah. 
Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good people. Uh, can I borrow this one for a second? So, so Oscar has trusted me to uh, to take this company uh, internationally, and uh, he didn't trust me more though than at the uh, at the first university presentation. He gave me this one and uh, wanted me to demonstrate it. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, I went along, and uh, I can tell you, it it it, um, it, it works. Uh, I turned it out. <laughs> uh, so uh, it was a lot of fun though, and uh, we had to actually stop it because the students they were so they thought that was just so cool. So they started doing it too to sort of check out what it was. Uh, for me, it was important because I think. Animal welfare is a very important aspect of this whole thing. So I didn't want to lead a company without knowing what we were doing here. Um, so to me, that, that's a bit of the trust that we're talking about here. And um, I have to say, already before I start saying much more here, already we met a lot of you guys. And, and thanks for all that trust and confidence you've shown in us. It's, and we, we are small Norwegians and uh, come from a tiny country. And, uh, and we, we're going to need your help to succeed. Our philosophy is going to be that we're not going to sell hard on this. We're not going to oversell it. That's one thing we're never going to do. We're going to make sure that you guys are happy, and we're going to say no to the people we don't think is going to be happy with it in the beginning, if the use case is not there and so forth. So if we can get to the point where we get up with use cases that are really good, and the farmers that get those cases can recommend it. So that's our ask. If you if you trust us to work with you, and we trust you to recommend us to two more people, that's the philosophy we have. Uh, so we're not going to set up a huge sales operation and so forth. We're going to really rely on working with farmers, and then have you guys recommend us. That's the, that's the philosophy behind the whole thing. Through that works, we've done that. So if I move to the next one, this is uh, the current situation. So we've got about two and a half thousand customers. There's uh, 35,000 colors in use. Actually, since that slide was made, we're up to 150 million hours of operations. So that gives us a vast amount of data. And I think the thing that really has blown my mind, I'm not a farmer, I, I come from a technology company, a scale of Norwegian company, up from 28 people to 1,200. So that, that's a video conference company, it's now number three in the world it's, uh, of its kind. And I don't have that farming background. I, I grew up close to a farm up in the mountains when, when I was a kid. So I've been milking the cows and uh, getting the goat and sheep around and so forth, but never been a farmer myself. But seeing out of those 150 million hours, not one single animal has not learned it. That, that to me is mind blowing. Uh, I guess there are among animals, it's, it's the same thing as people, right? It's uh, different personalities and so forth, and some stubborn ones and all these things. And uh, yes, there are some ones that test the, the, the borders more and so on. Uh, and you see animal behaviors a lot better, but really, they all learn it. So, We've been growing so fast, we're not able to really support demand at the moment uh, in Norway. And we're doing that deliberately uh, because we do want to grow internationally as well. So for us, it's not a good thing to only grow in Norway. Um, we want to grow out. Uh, and then, I don't know if you noticed, but there's some kind of a component crisis going on in the world right now. <laughs> so we're going to have a sort of plateau uh, in uh, 2022, uh, do about a little bit more than we did last year. Uh, and then we're really wrapping it up for 23 and 24. Uh, so there's going to be about 90,000 colors available in 23. Uh, we already set the orders for that in the factories. And then there's going to be 300,000 available for 24. So that's the plan progress as such. Uh, then we do get a lot of attention, so, so that is also the way we want to work here. Uh, work with you guys, create good stories, and, and, and rely on word of mouth on how to proceed. Uh, I'm also really stuck with the larger part of this story. Uh, yes, it helps farmers have a better everyday life and makes life easier for the farmer. But it also does something for the climate. And uh, I'm turning 60 this summer. And uh, I've grown up in Stavanger, uh, where it's an oil and gas capital, right? Used in the sister city. And um, this is like a chance to give something back. So, so when Oscar presented this opportunity, I, 
I, I didn't I didn't join a job. I, I fell for the whole concept, and I thought this is something I'd like to use my life for now, for for the rest of it, to make this happen. Uh, and um, you know the whole. We're not going to teach you about it, but to be able to move cattle, sheep, goats in a structured way, where it's out in silver pasture, or it's on uh, log racing, or it's, it's manual racing, it is a tool to do that conveniently, which is just that it's, it's, By the touch of a finger, you open new pastures and you give them access. So, why don't everybody do this now? I think you guys are probably ahead of the game. Well, there's two main reasons. It's labor intense and it's knowledge intense. So people need to understand and know these things. And we think we can assist on both those areas. We can make it a lot easier. And we can also build knowledge and automation into the app that helps people understand this. We'll build custom success teams. That's going to be incredibly important for us. So sales is not really going to do a ton of sort of convincing and we really want customer success to make clients succeed and then, then sales can come and help with logistics and orders and so forth. So that's the sales model as such. So we really want to support you guys through the lifetime of your project and ventures. Then we're going to work with got local consultants and specialists within different fields. We're not going to do all those things ourselves, we're just going to be that bridge so, we, so we, you're sure that your racing consultant, if you're using one, they're talking to us, we'll understand what's going on. And, and sort of going to have capacity to really roll out big ventures as such, but work with whoever are specialists within the field that you want to address this on. You guys are the specialists. You are the expert on your land, on your type of use, and we can be a tool to enable you. I thought this one would be fun to see. This is a time lapse of pasture movement. Um, if you see here, the red obviously is the highest density of the livestock. And as you move the fence, the animals just follow. Mm -hmm. And we're not wondering whether it works or not. It's, it works. <laughs> <laughs> so, we believe we're addressing global challenges at scale. And this is the beauty of this. We, we're really able to do that. And uh, I thought I'd hand it over to you, Christopher, uh, to sort of show a bit of that. Um, and then, if I just give you the mic, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, I'm just going to take you on a small virtual journey from Balkan Tugosora, where our head office is. And uh, the map that you're seeing on the screen now is uh, a live map with um, with all the animals that are carrying the open scholars uh, so, right now. So the hand is right on the building. This is the the big head office in Bakunjur's <laughs> Erdo. Four hundred people, uh, Oscar, right? <laughs> yeah. Four hundred people in the place, not in the head office. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And as you can see, it's, it's December in Norway, so it's uh, snow covered. So uh, if we were here in uh, in July, uh, it would be you couldn't you couldn't even see the green uh, underneath there. But still, a lot of animals uh, outside with colors right now. Uh, so you see Norway, you see the UK with uh, Scotland and uh, also Ireland. Uh, if you Go a little bit further out. Uh, we are also present in Spain and France, and these are mainly the uh, university projects, the research projects that uh, we were speaking about. And then there are a couple over in the US where we have two right now. So the one to the left is. This one here. <laughs> now, the one to the right, we will hear, hear more about in a second. So, uh, so yeah, I think we can go to the next slide. Uh, so, uh, as mentioned in the beginning, there is a uh, private input form on the tables. Um, as we mentioned, we are looking to do some uh, pilot projects with customer this spring. Uh, so please, if you are interested in that, uh, come and see us uh, or 
put your name and contact information down on the paper. We'll be around after the uh, after the session here, outside and uh, downstairs on the first floor. I think it is uh, to the right of the reception area there. Uh, so please come and see us. We are there for the, the whole day until the end. Um, so um, let's have a look at the the right little uh, cow that we can see on the map, and uh, that's one of Montes. Well, thank you. Um, it, it's been really interesting. Uh, I, I've been following virtual fencing for a period of time also, and uh, um, I, I really tried to, to track down the, and looked at the three or four providers that are out there, and, and I just was able to get connected with no fence, and it, it's been an exciting journey so far. So I just wanted to share some of the things that uh, we're doing at our farm and uh, some some things that it's brought to mind for me. And I'd love to hear your thoughts of, of where you think uh, we can utilize this uh, this wonderful tool for our farms. A uh, little bit about me, uh, fifth generation farmer in Cambridge, Illinois. This is the home farm that was settled in 1869. Uh, we do a lot of uh, no-till and advanced crop nutrition practices. Grow crop farmer, I spent my childhood tearing out fences, tearing down barns, getting rid of wells, tearing out water lines and everything because we're, gonna, we're corn farmers. And that's what we do is we raise corn. So uh, then we started doing cover crops again on every acre and then, then we just stumbled into people like Gabe Brown and realized, oh, we can improve soil quality even faster by integrating livestock. Gee, I wish I wouldn't have tore out all those fences in the barn. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, I get an opportunity to travel around the country and, and work with other farmers and it's just a joy to help farmers implement soil health principles and practices within their own context. It's just, I love problem solving and it, it's just a great, great time to get to work with other farmers. So here's some of the things we do on a row crop operation. Um, we got a very high tech planter. We can plant two hybrids at once. We put out three nutrient mixes at once in five separate locations, everything very, very capable, okay, and climate control and all that. Uh, we've done things where we do different crops within the same field based on slope. Uh, we're not afraid of high residue for planting no-till corn. Uh, we do interseeding, uh, you know, homemade built interseeders. Uh, we really piloted the skip uh, row corridor for planting. So uh, we have GPS steering on both planters and seeders in order to leave a skip strip where we can plant in between. Uh, we do companion cropping. We've done that for four years now. Wheat, wheat and beans, rye and beans at the same time. We've done 60 inch rows uh, and companion cropping there. Uh, so we're not afraid to, to look and explore new ways that we can improve soil health. But this has been one of my favorite things, and that's bringing livestock back to the land. And we realized when we did this, we had to keep all the margin that's involved in meat and egg production because of the high cost of doing things and, and doing things on a smaller scale. So we decided to go to the direct marketing approach. So everything's born, raised, and goes to freezer camp on our farm and then comes back and spends the time in the freezer until it goes to a family's table. So uh, we do everything from basically soil to table, uh, and we just don't cook it for our customers yet. <laughs> so that's some of the wonderful things we've met. Uh, doctors have been out to our farm. We've had FAA students. We have our consumers come out. We have our wonderful concert with the cows once a year. It's a must, must attend. Uh, we do home delivery shipping throughout the United States. And I get to enjoy some really good food as a result of all this project. So really, we regenerate soil and raise great food. That's what our farm is. I'm no longer a corn farmer, okay? I make food. And I make food that's healthy for families, healthy for the environment, healthy for animals. So to give you a little context of our farm, we have two main things. We have the cropland here on the left, and we have a, a winter and summer pasture type arrangement on the right. This area, and I, I should have put the slide in here, but in the 1938 flyover, you can count about 200 trees in there, okay? Now it's 80 acres of timber that's been overgrown with all sorts of crap that the USDA has told us to plant one time or the other and we can't get rid of. So we're, we're doing our best to restore that back to an old hickory savanna, which is natural. 
But this is what we're doing now is we put high tensile perimeter fence up, poly wire in between, we run pasture map, we do different uh, divisions, but you can see uh, everything has to be kind of squares and line up and those kind of things. And then when I put cattle in this area, they'll eat the really tender stuff on the weak side hills, they'll leave the, the heavier stuff in the bottoms and kind of hit the stuff on the tops. So then the next time around, they've got nothing on the side hills where I need the cover crop, and they've ignored the bottom, and it's turned, it's headed out cover crop. So I mean, it's just, we're doing our best to manage. We've, we've increased numbers to where we're running 200,000 pounds of animals at a time, which helps, but still it's, it's a lot of work, okay? And, and not a lot, and, and not the greatest management. So here you can see, uh, I, have, I have a new appreciation for goat grazers. Um, we had a person come to our farm that was moving from Nashville, took a local job, and I just offered our farm. You can go camp out in the woods, and you know, they had rent a room in it, you know, and then between jobs, I can be your home base. Well, I got to see what it's like for them to put poly net through multi-floral rows, um, poison ivy, uh, down trees and everything. So when they set up a new paddock, they go out the chainsaw and like full body armor to, you know, put this through and I'm like, wow. So there's the two super tough ladies that does not work here. I know. Now <laughs> <laughs> this cow guy here is uh, complaining when he puts a single poly wire through the, <laughs> through he has to step over go through a creek and everything anyway. Um, so I think this is a, one of my favorite quotes, okay? So we can't keep doing the same thing incrementally back, okay? We can't keep doing a few more bushels, okay? We can't keep doing a, a little more a little more wire, a little more movement. If we're gonna really make big changes in agriculture, we gotta really change the way we do and think of things, okay? And uh, I'm proud to, uh, here is the North America's very first uh, no fence cow, F11. Oh, sorry, you don't have a, a rosy name or something like that. So I just been installed it and she went right back to nursing there. I was pretty excited. The next day I go by and I don't know if you can see this little bit of dampness on the bottom of the collar. That was after she had taken a drink and, and plunged the collar right into the water. I'm like, oh great, I'm gonna fry electronics on day one. You know, but no problem, they're water tested, pressure tested. Worked perfect ever since, and uh, doesn't bother her one bit. And uh, it, it's been really, really interesting to watch. So just a little bit of my experience so far with no fence. Uh, what I can see is using it. First off, outstanding team. You could probably tell that from the uh, folks that talked to you here earlier. I, I got confidence in what they're doing because they got many units in use. Many of these people are, are still kind of experimenting, you know, and it kind of works, kind of doesn't, and iteration and such. I don't really like being a test dummy. Um, and then connectivity is outstanding. That was one of my concerns: is this going to connect and, and you know be on be live on the internet? That's been no problem. Battery charge is great. You know, I have solar everything: solar wells, solar chargers, and I have problems with batteries because we don't live in Arizona, do we? So it, it's done a great job. I've never seen the onboard battery be less than 80%, and that's after 10 days of clouds. So yeah, the panels are built right into the sides. It's, it's kind of cool. Look at it close after the session. And then uh, one thing that's been really good is uh, we've had some blizzard conditions lately. Uh, what do cows like to do when it's blowing, snowing, and cold? They drift. They walk into the wind, right? Mm -hmm. And what do, they, what do they pay attention to that wire that's at the edge of the field as they're walking? Mm -hmm. Or they just go right over top because the yeah. snow is covered, right? Yeah. So, you know, normally what I do is you know, I get up and I go out in the middle of the night and get the truck stuck, and then I gotta get the tractor out and unstuck the truck to go see if the, you know, the cattle are in place. I'm not kidding you. It was the biggest thing. I could just open my phone and like, oh, she's there. Perfect. And go to sleep. But that, that, that's just until you've done that the first time, it, it, you don't really appreciate that. So supply chain, the world's on pause, right? You know, uh, so disruptions. I haven't been able to install collars on our entire herd, and it really requires the entire herd because of behavior in order to fully utilize the no fence thing. So mine has been basically: is it connecting? Is it working? Is it charging? Is it everything working? And yes, it is. But you know, I was hoping at this present, you know, by this presentation, I'd logged a month and a half of grazing with them. I haven't done that yet, but eventually, here in a few months, I'll get the rest of the collars and you know, stay tuned. You can follow me on social media and stuff for for what it is. But I'm not expecting any sort of big surprises. You know, we we can train cattle. We buy in to hotwire in three days, so I, I'm 
no biggie. Um, so here's here's a view of the app. Okay, so uh, you can see right here. I, I, I took these screenshots last night. So uh, you know, there's where she's located. Here's her battery charge at 9:26 at night at 91 percent. And it says out of range of, of Bluetooth, but when I come up close to her, it'll connect to my phone, and then I can play a little tune. But Oscar made it some Norwegian tune, so we're going to have to update you know, something cooler. Uh, but, uh, something you recognize. So she, at this time, she just uh, connected to the internet six minutes ago. So then I'm taking, you can do a little screenshot. Here's where she was yesterday. She went there, the water tank's up here. She was, we fed some hay down here. And then in the last week she was here, and then remember last week we had some cold wind? She got down, she went over here to the trees. So right now their excluded fence is here. Because I was grazing around and all of a sudden the snow came, I had to stop. So I've been hay feeding in place until the snow goes away, then we'll continue grazing as we move south. So, you know, she's smart, she knows what she's doing. So I want to walk you guys through some scenarios for no fence, work daily moves, and Yes, real quick. What kind of a time factor in, the, in each of those positions do you have? Do you have a continuous time? Yeah, I think it's pinging every 15 minutes. Yep, I see. Okay. Yeah. And you can manually ping it too, I think, if you want, right? <laughs> so, very good. So, if you're a set stock grazer, okay, you're by yourself, you're busy, you're farming and everything, put the cows out in the pasture, come back later, right? I think pretty much every set stock grazer is aware that they could double their stocking capacity by moving them on a, on a daily basis, okay? But there's not 30 hours in a day. So that just kind of gets let go because there's more things to do. And I think this is a real opportunity for that set stock grazer to now have the time to go to multi paddock type of scenarios. So moving on a daily basis or three day basis, whatever. So I think that's pretty exciting to see. Um, for the rotational grazer where maybe you've got paddocks set up that you move them every seven to ten days, okay great, you've got that infrastructure in place, not just subdivide those paddocks, subdivide them into daily moves or twice a day moves or ten times a day moves, I mean you can be as wild as you want, right? So I, I think that allows us to get even more stocking rate, better herd health. And then the daily move grazer like we are, I'm going to hit my target time every day. If you're a daily move grazer, you can identify with me. If your target time is 10 a.m., okay, who hits it more than once a week if you have row crops and everything else going on? Okay, I have the, the chaos factor at our farm. If something's gonna go wrong, it does. 10 a.m. becomes 11 a.m. And then tomorrow is 9 a.m. Now all of a sudden I've just decreased my pasture exposure by 20, 15% of that two hour change, right? That's a big deal. So I had a chance to do that. And then also, it, it increased it multiple times a day. I did a project, um, JR, are you in here? Anyway, JR is here at the conference. He helped me do this project. And uh, we were doing 10X moves, you know, because we're gonna restore a native seed bank. And I happened to pick the two weeks to do it was when it was about 100 degrees and 100% humidity. And I had two guys that were just about ready to kill me at the end because all they did was move the fence all day long as part of this trial. So now we can do that a little more thing easier. Everyone, I think paddocks can be any shape or size. And I, I don't think about this. You don't have to be connected to an exterior fence. I mean, think about that. If you want it to be long and skinny and squiggly, which I'm going to be on my side hills. So I'm going to feed tops at four acres a day. I'm going to feed my side hills at eight acres a day. And I'm going to feed my bottom at three acres a day. So I keep up and graze correctly. And I'll exclude to give more uh, regrowth time on the side hills. I'll hit it faster on the bottoms. Because guess what? I don't have to drive with a four-wheeler in a straight line and set posts every 25 paces or whatever it is. Who cares? Make it in shape. Okay, so this is audience participation for fun. Uh, which is your favorite time to set fence? Is it when the ground is froze and you have to drill a hole for the post, which I'm doing right now? How about, who enjoys that? Show of hands, come on. Somebody, somebody enjoys that. Okay, is it when it's pouring rain and it's so muddy that the ATV can barely move or get stuck and there's lightning? Who enjoys that? <laughs> Anybody been there? There you go. <laughs> is it when you're planting, harvesting, doing other farm activities, taking animals in, it's like, oh, I've got to 
hard to get there to move. Who enjoys that? You know, that happens, right? Uh, when you're on vacation, who enjoys getting their neighbor to uh, come and do it? And does the neighbor ever do it, right? So you give them a three-day paddock, and you come back, and it's not grazed right, and you look at it for a year that way, right? Uh, uh, or through the woods and crossing a creek. We talked about that earlier, right? Isn't that fun? How many stepping posts does it take to cross a creek? It's like one here, one here, one here. <laughs> you get to watch your wife slide into the creek on the Oh, <laughs> You know, in a spa, they call that a mud treatment, right? She has a spa day. Okay. So here's some additional ideas I have with, with what is capable of what these gentlemen have, have created and are delivering to us. Is walk the herd down the roads from field to field. Now, Oscar guaranteed me this would work. <laughs> so I have you know 500 acres of cropland in one spot, and about 400 acres of cropland in another spot, two mile distance. Guess what I got to do now? Load them onto a 24 foot gooseneck trailer. It takes four, like three people, all day long, cattle are in the sun until about 3 p.m. to get that moved up. It's just not good for us or the cattle. And I, there's no fences anymore. You can't count on them. You know, cowboy up, you can't even find enough people with uh, horses to actually know how to use them, right, to walk them down the road. So now we can set those no fence perimeters on the old fence lines, lead, follower, move them as a group as one, far less stress. So not be afraid to have goats. Honestly, I'm afraid to have goats because a friend of mine says, the only, uh, the only fence that'll hold a goat is uh, one that'll hold air. So you know, I, that, that kind of scares me a little bit, but I need, you saw the context up there that pasture on, right? I need browsing. Okay, and sheep aren't enough. So I, I need browsers to take care of that. And I, I look forward to using that. You know, use in forest management, much, much easier. Sacrifice pasture when the weather forecast was wrong. Is, it, is your weatherman ever wrong? <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, we're supposed to get a half inch today, and then four inches later, we got a, a mud, bog, mud, mud bog. You know, we can make those sacrifice pastures easier on the fly instead of being out there to do it so that we're not damaging pasture. So I think those are some things. Okay, so here's my wild vision for the future. Why I'm so excited about these things and I talk about it on the Ag Emerge podcast and, and it's like really part of the culture of what we do at Ag Solutions Network is I want to do auto grazing. They mentioned two things. It's, it's the technology and the knowledge to make grazing work, okay? I think this allows us to have a connected data hub on that where we can monitor everything she's doing activity-wise, biometrically. I think we can have autonomous water, mineral oiler that follows with the herd. So that way we're not limited to have to always fence back to a water source. I think we can use imagery to assess forage quantity and quality, already doing that. And then we can auto-generate those paddocks based upon growth and forecast growth. Okay, when the pasture's growing fast, do you slow them down or speed them up? Scott? Speed them up. Speed them up. When the pasture's growing slow, do you slow them down? Yeah. Slow them down. How many, be, how many corn farmers know how to do that? <laughs> okay, I do, right? So I want to make this grazing so easy, even a corn farmer can do it, right? Yeah. You know, even a caveman, no, in this case, even a corn farmer. I'm a corn farmer, right? So I'm, I'm pointing at myself here. And I think if you really think about it, feedlots exist because they're the most economical way to produce meat. And I believe technology can enable us to bring livestock back to land and make it the most economically way. Yeah. You know, bringing the livestock back to the land. You know, when technology lowers the cost of land-based meat, when energy costs continue to increase, which they will, period. And feedlots are very energy intensive, both on the feedstuffs and on the hauling and on the maintenance of them. When the value of the food quality is rewarded, so rather than just grass-fed, organic, and conventional, when we have, and this is very near, folks, this is not far away, in my lifetime we'll see it, we'll know an exact nutritional value of everything we eat, and we'll be paid accordingly. And when externalized costs to the environment, runoff, dust emissions, pollution, noise, everything is realized in society to what it does to local communities, when all of those costs are accounted for, you think the amounts will exist? I don't think so. So the paradigm is changing, and I think it's important to remember, it's, uh, that's one of my favorite quotes, you know, what did man was what I 
did not know the things I knew which were not so. So if we think we know the capable model is here to stay and it's the only way to go, we're going to do incremental improvements of the candle in a feedlot, beware, the light bulb is coming mm -hmm. and these gentlemen are the foundation of the light bulb. <laughs> so looking forward to, you can reach out, these are different uh, groups of people I've been able to uh, put together over time. We have some wonderful teams around the country. We get to do some amazing work and fun things with farmers. Uh, stay in touch. Uh, definitely sign up for that pilot program that they've got. I know there's a limited number and they want to make sure you're successful. And uh, reach out anytime or ask any questions if you can. So that's all I have. I think I'm on time. I did it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Fantastic. So let's ask questions. Yeah, you bet. <laughs>